Salam and welcome to our YouTube channel, Somali Dispatch. For news and information relating to Somalis around the world, please visit uh, somalidispatch.com. I'm Abdul Qadir Gouled. Dr. Abdirsaq Mohamed Warfa is a Minnesota based author and a professor of biological science at the University of Minnesota. And he is uh, the prolific writer of Cries from the Hinterland, a historic book about the heartbreaking colonial history of Somalis in the Horn of Africa, and specifically about the gut-wrenching historical events in the Ethiopian ruled Somali regions. Abdusak joined me tonight from his home in Minneapolis, and I began our, by, uh, began our conversation by asking him about the reasons and the timeliness of writing this book. Mm. Thank you, Abdul for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you. Um, so the book, one of the reasons I really wrote was I wanted to make sure that we own the narrative about the history of East Africa. Often um, our history is written by others. And when they write about it, they're often writing things that are not from our own perspective um, and tends to be negative. So what I wanted to do was, okay, what is the truth about this history for this particular region? So the book is focusing on the Somali region, um, has multiple names, so it's a contested name, but got multiple, I feel comfortable calling it the Somali region. Um, so it's really looking at the history of this region from the end of 19th century when the British gave it to Ethiopia until the change that happened recently. That's great. Um, the book starts off with you being somewhat a young man. You, you gave mm -hmm. away your age there. Um, mm -hmm. At the beginning or the height of the 7-7 uh, war, mm -hmm. you and your family were at the time living in, in Hargeisa. Mm -hmm. And um, if you can uh, do a, a comparison uh, of periods then and today, what the realities are. Yeah, so in the book, I, I, I make the argument that um, of the course of my life, my living history, right? Of the course of my living history, the story of this region has been one of conflict and war, right? So I was born in 1975. I was two years old when the 1977 uh, war happened. Um, at the time, my family lived in Hargeisa, um, currently Somali land. Um, and what I can remember is the sound of the MiG-21, MiG the Russian MiG that the Ethiopians were using to bombard um, areas close to the border with Ethiopia and Hargeisa, Borama, um, all the towns along the border were target. Um, you know, those experiences, those early experiences shape you, right? And inform your world. It's the lived experiences. And it's actually one of the reasons I wanted to write the book because one of the things that's often missing from history books is what is the lived experiences of the folks who live through conflict? Um, I, I, I always talk about uh, an interesting story that an elder tell me. Um, he was born in 1948. When he was born in 1948, right? Um, Somalis were fleeing from the conflict um, because that was when the British decided to give the region back to Ethiopia for a second time. And um, the fever of independence was on the air, right, all over all of the African countries. And Ethiopia didn't want Somalia actually to have independence because it was a threat to her existence. Um, so that was the first uh, refugees from that region. A lot of them moved from that into Somali proper. And then 1977, he fled again because of the uh, 1977 war. And he was telling me that uh, his niece was born in 1991 in Efo refugee camp, right? So we're people who are always on the move because of conflict. Um, so those experiences are what really inform the way I see history, right? Because all I can remember is hearing those sounds of the mid-21s and the American airplanes that the Ethiopians spoke, and then the stories that I grew up with. So um, in, in, especially Hargeisa was a nugget for Somali boats who often had a lot of bombs about 
um, the war, the Somali-Ethiopian war and conflict. So those also inform my upbringing, right? Mm -hmm. Dodan was um, come and stay in my home. He used to, um, you know, used to come and I grew up listening, even though I was very young and a child, I grew up listening to all the booms, all the, right? And then you yeah. get Hadrawi, who was who has become known because of his uh, poetic um, uh, words against uh, um, mm -hmm. you know, colonialism and all of the struggle that Somalis face. Right, and, and you also reference, uh, you know, uh, Somali poets, uh, modern Somali poets, if you will, uh, uh, via, via rappers, right? Uh, Kainan mm -hmm. and and Sharma Boy in their uh, Somali, uh, Somali Valley, which we can uh, we can talk about another time because that's a different facet of, of, of mm -hmm. thinking and, and looking at how that actually, um, you know, uh, refers to the Somalis in Northern Africa. But on your mm -hmm. book, um, Christ from the Hinterland, uh, it covers uh, extensively Somali regions uh, tumultuous past. Um, starting with the period between 1948 to um, 2018, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, what are the highlights without giving away? We want the beep, we want people to buy the book. So <laughs> yes. not diving too much into it, no spoilers. Uh, yeah, what yeah. are the highlights during that period? Yeah, so so the book starts with actually telling the first, um, so there was a British uh, writer, um, who wrote about um, the Somali history back in 1982, a book he called The Betrayal of Somalis, right? Yeah. And the argument he was making was that the betrayal actually started in back in 1897 when the British gave uh, the region to Ethiopia. Okay. And what people often don't know is the history behind that. Why did the British, right? Uh, you know, it's easy to chronicle history to say, okay, 1897, this happened, 1948, this happened, right. you know, 1977, this happened, 1984, this happened. Right. But that, that doesn't add any value to the history. What you really yeah. want to understand is why. why right. did we, and we will get to that, actually. Right. Uh, the reason uh, the British actually flip-flopped in their, in their outlook um, as it related to their interest. Mm -hmm. uh, the Horn of Africa and what it meant for Ethiopia to make that deal in uh, 1897 treaty. But uh, going back to my previous question, mm -hmm. the, the timeline that I gave mm -hmm. you is- We'll give you the idea for the timeline. Yeah. So what I wanted to start with was that history, first of all, that, you know, how did this region went under Ethiopia? Then that's a period that we could call the conquest period, because that's when Manila was trying to you know, expand from the sea to Khardun. So that was the conquest period. But the 1948 to 2018 is when there was armed struggle, right? So it started with, one is the region, elders of the region realized that they were not getting their independence along with the North and the South, they pick up guns, right? So Geish come into the play in 1963, but actually it was 1950 that they started doing hit and run essentially. Um, so 1948 and 2018 is interesting because that is armed struggle period. Then come 2018 when the only remaining armed uh, body, the ONLF, or the National Liberation Front, um, sees their armed struggle. Right. So from 2018 up to now, to the present, we have um, no armed group in the region that are looking for um, whatever it is that, you know, whether it's freedom, whether it's autonomy, whatever the end goal is, it doesn't involve armed struggle. So it was three related periods, right? So conquest, armed struggle, and then a period that is peaceful in the sense that there's no armed struggle but questionable in terms of where things go. To um, go back to the, to the, the uh, time period where mm -hmm. um, the Ethiopian, um, you know, Ethiopia got the Ogaden basically with mm -hmm. the British uh, acceding uh, the Ogaden to Ethiopia during the, uh, or at the uh, 1897 treaty. What, mm -hmm. how did that come about? What was the reasons that the British actually had to do that? Yeah, so it's very important to understand that when the British came to Somaliland, right? And again, when we use the word Somaliland, we don't mean the present day Somaliland. 
back then almost all of the Somali the areas was on Somali land. Right. Um, when they came, um, their main goal was to find resources for their army, for their soldiers in Aden, Yemen, and in India, right? So that's why they stayed on the coastline, right? They didn't venture far away from the coastline. Um, but then they realized that there's really good camel meat in the Houd and the Ogaden. So that's how they, you know, that became a proctorate for them. But then Sudan happened. So the Mahdi Sudan was trying to drive the British and the Egyptians out of Sudan. And then there was a struggle with the France, with the French and the Russians trying to take over the Nile River. So Britain was looking at how do we defend um, the Nile River? How do we prevent the French taking over the Nile? And actually there was a famous um, event that happened um, in South Sudan in which the British and the French um, uh, got into each other. So the British wanted to make sure that the Mahdi does not get a military support armies and weapons from Ethiopia. So the question becomes, well, why was the British worried about Ethiopia having weapons or armies? Well, it turns out in 1884, when they were defining uh, the African uh, countries among themselves, the Europeans decided um, what's called the Brussels Act in 1890 uh, to have an arms embargo, right? Which essentially said that we cannot no arms can be sold to African countries, but there was a catch, there was an exception, except if you're a Christian country. Yeah. So, and, it, and, and what was Menelik arguing? Menelik was arguing that I'm a Christian um, country surrounded by pagans, right? So he got arms from many French and, and, and Russians. So the France and Russian were selling the arms. British was worried about Great Britain was worried about the arms flowing to the Mahdi, right? So in order to afford that, they, you know, send um, um, their ambassador at the time, which was located in Egypt, to Ethiopia to negotiate. Well, and there was another incident uh, back in 1896, the famous Adwa uh, war in, in which in the, uh, Italian, the yeah. yeah, yeah. They, you know, the Italians, uh, there were strong 25,000 army. A lot of them were Italians. So the Italians lost about 6,000, um, actually Italians, right? So it's not, unlike the British and the France, um, Italians actually wanted to settle in East Africa, not just considered as a colony. Mm -hmm. So they were actually wanted to make it home for all the Italians that were moving there. So that gave legitimacy to Menelik. The, the fact that they defeated the Italians in Adwa gave them legitimacy. So Great Britain was thinking, oh, this is an actual country that we can make deals with, right? Um, so in the book, I talk about how the um, American, I mean, the British agent um, sends you know, messages back to London saying, this is way, way different than what I thought. I have to give up a lot more, right? And that's how they ended up making the Ogaden the sacrificial lamb for their goals to keep the Ethiopians out of Sudan and prevent weapons going to the Sudan and make sure that the Nile River remains with them and the Egyptians, right? right. So that was the really, um, the main reason, remember, the British um, prime minister at the time really didn't care about the African countries, right? Um, for them, it was about what is our interest? What do we, what sort of a transaction can help make our interest uh, become reality in this part of the region, right? right. Um, so Ogaden was not a thing to them. It was a land that they can give up. To gain the support from the Ethiopians, right? Or to keep mm -hmm. the Ethiopians on side. It's, it's interesting, Western uh, interests in general and British remain the same, 2022. Um, it's, 
you know, uh, what's my interest? Uh, but Somalis have different way of analyzing relationships. Um, mm. But perhaps uh, the British government's role in, in greater Somalia uh, from Somali perspective could be characterized if you read the book or, or the history in general mm. as confusing. At one mm. point they were uh, promoting uh, greater Somalia in the Horn of Africa through the uh, Bevan plan. Tell us a bit about uh, that yeah. and what the book covers about that. Right, we come to 1948, which is actually, I think it's the most cons consequential year for the region. And I say the most consequential year for the region for, for the following reason. 1945, 1948, right? All the colonial powers, whether it's the British, the France, uh, all Italians were defeated, so they have no say really. So it was mainly the British, the Italians and the Soviet Union. Um, realized that the European countries cannot hold their colonies anymore. So they have to give these countries their freedom. So the question becomes then, um, what about the Italian colonies? So Italy was defeated in 1941. So from 1941 to 1948, the British army, right? Um, the British administration army is actually in charge of all Somali speaking countries except Djibouti, which was under, um, yeah. under the French. So Bevan proposed the idea of uniting these regions, Somali-speaking regions, under the greater Somalia, right? Under the greater Somalia. And they didn't want to touch Djibouti. They, they were thinking about it, but they didn't want to um, have a conflict with a fellow uh, Ally, yeah. member. That's right, yeah. Right? Um, but you, you really raised an interesting question, which is why did the British want to have all these different entities as one unit, right? But remember, it's still about interest. What did the British see in the Ogaden and the Houd? They see oil and they see fertile land, right? What do they see in the north? Access to Berbera, access to Sela. What do they see in the south? So for them, it was about resources and uh, making and sure that the resources all those together. resources, they can control it as one unit. So they didn't really care about Somalis coming together, but they wanted to be the power that has the most say in what's happening in these affairs. Um, the Americans didn't buy it. And that's why they prevented the region to actually gain independence. Again, what was the reason for Americans? Oil. Right? right? So they knew there was an oil in this region. The American uh, oil company Sinclair, which was later bought by Arco, had the contract to dig wells. And it's the same reason that the Americans made sure Eritrea federated with Ethiopia in 1950, because the plan was to get the oil from the Garden and then, um, you know, send it from Asmara, right? So it was, I think the region become, uh, you know, it's clash of powers, British right. interest, American interest, right? So it was an international policy struggle that really caused this region to remain within Ethiopia. But mm -hmm. your point is well taken that the Americans also did see the resource rich uh, region and wanted their piece of the pie, which goes back to the basic interest. Yeah. So um, there is, um, there is uh, I was looking at the book, um, a quote that from Cordell Hall, who was uh, an advisor to President Roosevelt. Right. And, and he, in, in September 1944, he tells him, the Ogaden is an integral part of the treachery of an independent state and an ally of ours. So hands off of That's the Ogaden. Right. Right. And, you know, even looking forward, uh, prior to um, 2018, uh, ONLF probably was the only American friendly um, armed group in, in Horn of Africa. And, mm -hmm. and for Ethiopia and America to be close, but uh, America to also have uh, ties to ONLF and some sort of a recognition in their armed struggle was also interesting. But to go back to your book without giving away too many uh, nuggets, um, it cover, the book covers and you uh, rightfully documented atrocities uh, suffered mm -hmm. by Somalis under Ethiopia uh, extensively. 
uh, but not as much in, in, in inner Somali fighting uh, during the period in which you covered. Could, could one argue those fightings are just a byproduct of the bigger picture or um, is there a need uh, in order to understand the bigger picture to also uh, discuss the inner Somali problems? So um, f- the first response I would give is the focus was on Ethiopian actions and not so much on um, inner fighter, you know, inner fight within Somalis. But I could also argue that the, yes, it was a byproduct of Ethiopian policies. Um, before 2010, when Adi came to power, the struggle was always between Somalis and non-Somali entities, right? Mainly Highlanders from, you know, Tigray and, and Amhara regions. So the to- soldiers were mainly Ethiopians by ethnicity fighting with Somalis, right? All of that changed in 2010 with the creation of the Liu police. So now you have Somalis against Somalis after 2010. Um, 2009, 2008, right? Around those, uh, around those times when Adi came to power in 2009. But that was an intentional policy by the Ethiopians to um, make sure that the conflict, what um, I'm trying to remember his name, um, Tobias, Tobias calls it indigenization, making the struggle indigenous, right? Indigenization of the struggle within, within the Somalis. So, you know, it is a direct byproduct of Ethiopian policy. Mm-hmm. Now, would Covering it give the overall big picture of what's happening in this region? Of course it will, right? Because a violence is violence no matter who committed it. Um, but it's not essential for understanding to why this region came under the Ethiopian um, authority and why did Ethiopian government, subsequent Ethiopian governments resorted to violence against the Somalis, right? the internal struggle within the Somalis does not explain how Ethiopian soldiers behave against the Somalis, right? And I really was trying to explain, okay, it's not something that is new. It's not something that TBLF did on its own. It is a historical fact that ever since Menelik, you know, conquered this region, Ethiopian soldiers behave the same way. So you could literally take a TBLF soldier Put him in, you know, early 20th century, he would behave the same way. You could take a soldier from early 20th century, put it in current Ethiopia, and he will behave the same way. Right. So the violence was a reflection of Ethiopian policy. And the interfight within the Somalis is also a byproduct of that policy, right? Mm-hmm. So I didn't feel the need to write about it. Mm-hmm. Um, uh- Right. No, that that makes perfect sense. But I, I was looking at it through the prism of, um, you know, the forte in, in Ethiopian army into Somali regions um, has multiple, you know, um, you know, effects and, and, and reasons. And there are things that made it easier division mm-hmm. being one of them. And so long that there's that all divide and conquer in place. It's 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 all things are just new again. Right. Yeah. And, and, and perhaps to go back to the need the um, to further speak to perhaps the need that the British had uh, mm-hmm. in the Horn of Africa and their interest, it was interesting to me in your book mm-hmm. that the British wouldn't agree to um, having uh, Sela included into mm-hmm. the territory in which they openly wanted and still do to a certain extent. That was interesting to me. Um, yes. It, uh, but it also was interesting to me that the Italians were not making such um, deals with the Ethiopians. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so interest is, is, is very unique. Yeah, yeah. I think the Italians have a different view and they actually um, behave differently than the British and the French. Um, and Saeed Samatar actually wrote about this in a book. Uh, he wrote about Somali nationalism in which he described how uh, Italians 
tended to behave differently. And I think the reason was because the Italians were trying to establish um, colonies, right? They weren't there just for the resources. They were trying to um, take over all of this part of the region. The Italians were actually trying to make a connection between the Ogaden and South Somalia, make it one um, autonomous region with one governor, right? Um, the sale deal was interesting in that one of the reasons I think the British wanted to make that deal is they realized the mistake they made in 1897 when they gave up the Houd and parts of the Ogaden region. Because remember, one of the things I don't talk about the book is um, tribes and clans. Um, you really can understand the Somali region without also talking about British Somali land because the clans are like this, right? So in the Houd, right, for example, you have camels from clans living in British Somali land going over to the Somali region and vice versa. For grazing and water, yes. For grazing and water, right? So the British realized that they gave up parts of the Houd that was essential for tribes under their proctorate. And the reason which they were there, which is the meat all the way to India. Right, all the way yeah. to India. So one way they thought that they could get back the hold on parts of the Ogaden, they didn't even ask for all of the Ogaden. They just asked for parts of the Ogaden and the hold. They thought, okay, maybe we can give up Sela because they knew that Ethiopians were always seeking, because Ethiopia is landlocked yeah. yeah. and always wanted to have access to water. Right. So the British were thinking, let's give up Sela, but in return, a re you know, about 25 miles from off the hood and, and, and the Ogaden. But Haile Selassie was thinking, wait, the Ogaden region is integral part of Ethiopia, so I'm not gonna give up anything. But they came back and said, okay, we can give parts of it, but they asked for a hundred mile region, right? All the lands, not only Sela, but all areas that the Isa tribe resided and all areas that the Gudebirsi tribe resided. So they were asking for a much, much Large bigger area. buy than the British were willing to give up. Well, mm -hmm. the British actually realized giving that up, you know, is taking away the resources and the very reason they were there for. So, you know, they had the second thought, um, but that actually also fell apart because the Americans made sure that Ethiopia had access to water via Eritrea. So Haile Selassie didn't see the need for Sela anymore yeah. and the whole yeah. deal broke now. Yeah, yeah it's worth uh, mentioning that at that time, Asmara was under Italian colony, but the Americans mm -hmm. wanted it to have it rejoin Ethiopia and they were uh, openly advocating for that. Um, mm -hmm. You reference uh, perhaps in your uh, precipice, but even before that in the book, um, the 2018 deal between the ONLF and, and the Ethiopian government. And, mm -hmm. um, and you've um, credited that uh, aspect um, of, of, of event to the fact that it could actually lead to prosperous time, or maybe we can move the needle in a way. And I will get back to that. But I, I was curious um, to note that how that deal came about. Mm. Now, um, if you if you think back in in the Somalia Ethiopia struggle when um, Mengistu and Siad Barre uh, mm -hmm. reached the deal, the deal was the basis to crush the rebellious groups. Mm -hmm. And do you think the owner left issue was the way the owner left agreement was handled? Do you think it was because the owner left was ready? to join the political sphere, uh, which I don't, I don't doubt they did, mm -hmm. but the way they joined had a lot more to do with Asmara and Addis Ababa than mm -hmm. it had to do with their own LF and Addis Ababa. Yeah, yeah, you're absolutely into something there. Um, so the, the principles, the, the one before 2018 was the 2012 conversations happening in Nairobi and those fall apart. Right, um, and one of the reasons they fall apart is Ethiopia sees ONLF as a weak, and all they're thinking about is um, how do we make sure that they put their arms down and come to Ethiopia. And one of the conditions 
that the Onelof struggled with at the time was the precondition to accept the Ethiopian constitution as is before anything else. Um, so why did they accept 2018? One of the difficulties that we have is nobody outside of the organization actually knows what the agreement looks like, what it is, what is included in the agreement, other than, you know, Onelof make, um, remember, it was Onelof that first made the decision to put arms down before they actually signed the agreement, right? They did that unilaterally without uh, the Ethiopians agreeing to it. I think Onelof went into these meetings um, naively thinking that Ethiopia is interested in peace. When exactly like you said, Ethiopia had always interest in deals that neutralize insurgencies. That was the main goal for Ethiopia, neutralize on the left, neutralize the Oromo uh, armies. That was the goal for Ethiopia. Um, but you're right, the, the Eritrean factor complicated a lot for, for the on the left. Yeah, so maybe they didn't have enough options. Abi Ahmed and, and Isaiah so for work who were tight to uh, plainly speak. Uh, at the time, and it sounded like uh, some sort of a pacification rather than uh, a bargain negotiated deal. But nevertheless, yeah, I absolutely it. think, yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but I absolutely think it was pacification. I absolutely think the goal for Utopia, um, I think in the book I used, uh, they wanted to give them a retirement package, have the uh, leadership come in, and, you know, this idea of, um, if you talk to ONLF members right now, they will tell you that this is not what we signed up for. Yeah, it without knowing like what they signed up, up for. Right? <laughs> right. So yeah, to continue on that uh, precipice uh, section of the book, um, you, you're you gleefully hopeful uh, of, of the future of the region. An mm -hmm. interesting observation, if, if you could elaborate on, on why that is. Well, so the thing is, we really don't know where things are going. Right, nobody knows, um, and that's what happens in change period. So I call this whole winds of change, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's really a wind. We don't know which way it will blow, right? right. It could lead to a hopeful future. Um, I think if you asked me two weeks ago, I would have said I'm very hopeful, very hopeful. Mm -hmm. um, but given the way the wind is going now uh, toward yeah. centralization, Abi Ahmed making sure that BP is one unit with at this Ababa having all say in the regions, right? Um, before the remember, Tigray rebels, even the Tigray rebels. I think Abi, uh, remember if I focus on the Somali region, before even when TPLF was in power, right? They were calling all the shots from Addis. They were calling all the shots from Addis, but the mechanism was different, right? In paper, it was always the regional uh, leadership that would make the final decision. So the TPLF will force the regional, uh, regional leadership to make certain decisions, right? But they would have to go through the Somali um, body, right? But if the way the wind is going right now, it looks like it's going to be a direct rather than indirect that all the members of PP will be part of central PP and there won't be regional PP that have oh, power, right? So yeah. those are the things that make me wonder you know, where are things going? We don't know. Maybe that's a good and, thing. And some, some argue the crux of the uh, Tigray War was just that. Um, the ethnic uh, federalism versus centralized federalism and, and what that means. Uh, having said that, um, taking the ownership of such a foreign concept uh, right down to the to Somali leaders in the region, towing that party line, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, what damage could that cause on the big picture of, of wanting a, a, a set of rule or liberation? So I... Yeah, and one of the things that I argue in the book is we have a new phenomenon in the Somali region, right? Um, I would say before the creation of Liubulis, before 2010, right? Um, 
the decisions about the region were coming from the armed struggle and folks who are involved in it. So the ONLF and others, right? I mean, we were focusing on the ONLF because they're really the main body. Um, they were the owners of the decision-making about what the, what should happen in the region. But right now, Chikchiga, the power is shifting to Chikchiga, right? So even if it's a peaceful um, period without armed struggle, ONLF essentially becomes um, irrelevant to the conversation in a mm -hmm. sense because of the way things shifted. So if that's the case and the decisions of this region will have to be made at Chikchiga, right? Well, the problem with Abdila was he become a patron. There was a patron client relationship, right? He was essentially a client for the TBLF, but empowered in Chikchiga. Well, if this new centralization happens, then whoever is in Chikchiga becomes a client for Addis. And what does that mean then for liberation? What does that mean for autonomy? It's likely that these ideas of we are Ethiopian and less of we are Somali will take hold, right? So that's what I, when I'm looking at the big picture, what I see is Ethiopianization of the Somali taking a stronger, and getting stronger. And this idea of autonomy or even you know, independence falling by the sideways if things go this direction. Because at least that, this idea of ethnic federalism, even on paper, right? If not in reality, on paper, it gives you a hope that mm, maybe one day I can exercise the rights to sell, you know, to independence through Article 39. Right, but if that shifts and the pendulum is switched back to, um, you know, Del 2.0, essentially, right, because that's what centralization would be, and the decision has to be made by Chikchi administration, and the ONLF becomes irrelevant to the conversation, then we know we're on the train to becoming part and partial of Ethiopia, mm -hmm. unless so. Mm -hmm. Right. So those are the worries I right. have. Right. And and some of the worries that are, are also rising out of the current situation in, in that region is um, the or almost if you if you, you know, you tr you can't like you said, you can't talk about the region without talking about ethnicity or tribal. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and if you look at the rise, the political capital rise of the Oromos. Mm -hmm. what it mm -hmm. means for the Somalis in that region, mm -hmm. uh, both of them being Muslim, and mm -hmm. maybe that alluding to sense of Ethiopianism within the Somalis. Mm -hmm. And you tie that to the interest that we talk about that others always had in the region. Mm -hmm. Now, if you take it down to the level of ethnic interest, it is mm -hmm. always the Oromos ha that have um, more of an intimate interest within the Somali region and they border and they share a lot of, uh, they intermarry, they share religion and the expansion, expansionism of, of uh, expansion of uh, the Oromos into the Somali regions are always seen as a threat now lately, mm -hmm. where before it was mm -hmm. the Amhara, the ruling party. So mm -hmm. the, the two ethnic groups being the Somalis and, 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 and the uh, Oromos, what does that mm -hmm. mean for the dynamic of the Horn and, and for the liberation and, and Ethiopianizing Somalis? So I think one of the problems that the Oromos have uh, is that they're actually more divided than we are. People think they're united, but they're actually more divided than, than we are. Um, I was talking, we were, a group of us were one, one time talking to Professor uh, Marina Gudina, who is the actually leader of uh, OFC, Oromo Federation Council or yeah, OFC. Anyway, he was telling, he was telling us that there are at least four major players in the Oromo and they don't agree with each other most of the time, right? So because if everything was equal, the Oromo should have had most of the power in Ethiopia right now, given the changes that are happening in 2018. 
Um, I think that the conflict we had with the Oromo is less these days than it was early in the 2018, uh, 2019. I think the last few years, uh, there is a peace between the Oromos and Somalis. But that could be just things hiding under the rug. They're and in charge now, right? <laughs> and they huh? need the coalition. They're in charge now and they need the coalition, right? Yeah, yeah. They, they need the coalition. Out. They yeah. need the coalition. I think I, I, would, I would worry more about the conflict that didn't get resolved with the uh, Afar, right? Because that, that did not get resolved. Um, but all overall, Ethiopia, Ethiopia, right? When we when we think about Ethiopia, what we should really be talking about is the solution of multi-state, right? Because the literature tells us that multi-ethnic states tend naturally to dissolve, right? It's a natural phenomenon for multi-ethnic states. Um, I mean, the idea of balkanization is very real when it comes to Ethiopia. The question is only really when, right? What's holding? There are a lot of cracks, a lot of cracks in the glue that holds Ethiopia together. So it's really a question of when would the balkanization happen, right? And I think the Somali region is one of the regions that will benefit the most if that were to happen. Um, some folks argue, we're not ready for it. We're not ready for it. You're never ready for independence. No, nobody's ever, right? Um, so. Right, right. Yeah. I agree. Um, finally, if you could tell us where, um, you know, our viewers can get the book. Um, yes, thank you. Um, and that would be, uh, that would be great, actually. Thank you, Abdul for having me. I really uh, enjoyed the conversation. Um, so it will be available on Amazon. So most folks should be able to order it from Amazon in about a week's time. Um, but I'm also doing a book tour. So I'll be in Toronto and then we'll be traveling to both Africa and Chikchiga and Hargeisa. Um, so folks can also get their copies during one of those tours. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of nuggets in the book and, and I will implore you to come back and, and talk about it. I, I didn't want to take the focus off of the Somali region and, and, and that being a big part of the book. But mm. what I also found fascinating was what was happening in the Somali region of Ethiopia mm. also was affecting and was happening and had an effect on the rest of the Somali regions in the Horn mm. of Africa and how the powers that be played their game. It, it was fascinating to me to have that all researched and put it together under one book and actually add analysis to it. I applaud you for that. And I applaud you for joining us today. Uh, no, thank, you very much. thank you very much, Professor. Thank you very much.